underway and we're, we're uh, joined tonight by the team from the active transport team in the department of transport and joined variously by Rachel Goldsworthy, Dean Butler, Tony Robinson and Patrick Aylwood. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. We've been talking about life in lockdown, dogs and, and now lamingtons. But before we get underway, I, I wonder if I could introduce you each in turn. I've, I've got a little bio on each of you. So I'll start yeah. with um, Patrick. The, 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 this is the order of speakers. So Patrick is the manager of Department of Transport brand and design team. G'day, Patrick. You, you have 20 years experience transport, specialising in public transport and information design, a long history of being involved with Wayfound and the IMAP working group as well as visitor services having been heavily involved with the City Circle Tram and the Yarra Trams Tourism Strategy. Um, following Patrick will be Dean Butler. G'day, Dean. Uh, who is the strategic creative lead for brand and design, user-centered approach applied across design and marketing network channels and projects with the aim of making journeys intuitive, consistent, and easier for all passengers. And there's a few key projects listed here, which I'll read out. Ongoing design and passenger information standards, wave found, Metro Tunnel Project, Free Tram Zone Project, Night Network Project, High Capacity Metro Trains Project, Next Generation Tram Project, and the Pop-Up Bike Lanes. Yay. Fair to say that Dean has touched almost every piece of visual identity on the network today. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've... you've in, just... some, in some way, shape or form, most likely. Yeah. Excellent. We're probably very familiar with your work. I, I, I know. <laughs> I, I live, live next door, basically, to the High Capacity Metro Trains um, yard where they unwrap them in in newport from the from the glad wrap out of china before they send them off down to dan and all was that you jonathan taking the photos could have been over the fence <laughs> that, that was me that was me yeah yeah, Forever no, trying to hide something. yeah i um yeah they look so shiny and new toby robinson has joining us as well good day toby uh acting senior program manager in a Melbourne cycling program. And Toby joined the department in 2019 to support transport planning across inner Melbourne and emerging precincts. With a background in architecture and urban design, Toby and his team sought to widen the transport lens beyond yeah. the curb, integrating transport and land use to foster sustainable and attractive public open spaces. He's an advocate of complete streets and towards zero methodologies, mode agnostic and works with the user front of mind. And with the uh, pandemic, Toby took on a new challenge to design and deliver an innovative style of cycling infrastructure, namely the pop-up bike lanes, which has delivered over 20 kilometres on improved cycling routes with an additional 80 kilometres being delivered over the coming months. That's fantastic. Toby's experience in developing collaborative designs with government and community stakeholders, designers, engineers and local manufacturers puts him at the forefront of cycling infrastructure design and delivery in Victoria. Known as the bike lane architect by one contractor, Toby aims to blend function, usability, road safety and quality design to shift more people onto two wheels. And three in some cases, if they're riding tricycles. Rachel Goldsworthy joins us as well, a proud owner of two dogs, one good, one bad, and is a senior project officer, Active Transport Victoria, with over 20 years experience working across creative agencies and public transport to develop, trial and deliver highly effective solutions while successfully navigating the labyrinth of complexities in managing projects. Has a passion for everything active, a sucker for a single speed bike, two gorgeous dogs, and making sure walking is part of the everyday. So welcome, Rachel, and Toby, and Dean, and Patrick, and I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks, Jonathan. I am struggling with a cold, so if I cough or splutter, I apologise in advance. Um, so before we sort of went into it, I guess we want to give a bit of a context, a little bit of background as to who we are and who we work for. Um, so you've just sort of listened to who we are which is great. And I do wish I had a second crack at my bio after hearing Toby's. <laughs> Impressive. Um, yeah, so I guess DOT, you know, um, we've all worked for DOT for a little while now. We've certainly been on a journey over at DOT. Uh, we restructured uh, on July 1, 2019. And we come from various parts of the um, various bodies before that, the Department of Transport, the little DOT, as we call it, Vic Roads and P2B when we came together to be the Department of Transport. Um, it's a big undertaking, a huge task, as you can imagine, with over 5,000 staff. So it's a really, uh, it's a big beast to work within. Uh, our role is primarily around delivering transport services end-to-end -end from planning, uh, running services, maintaining the network, and collaborating with MTIA, Major Transport Infrastructure Authority, to deliver major new infrastructure projects. <clears throat> 
Uh, it's a real opportunity though, Dot, something that we're continuing, continuing to realise um, over the coming years, uh, the holistic operation of, of the network for transport. Uh, with, you know, as you can imagine with, you know, various businesses working separately, there were always, you know, real challenges in trying to integrate the work, trying to understand the work and trying to work across businesses. So the changes provided a huge opportunity around integrated planning, integrated delivery, um, integrated running of services, et cetera. Um, have a much, including a much higher visibility of active transport. Um, when I was working at the public tra uh, PTV, active transport is certainly a topic, but certainly within the Department of Transport, it's a much bigger topic and a much, um, you know, better understood topic and a much more resource topic. Um, <clears throat> a big part of this is also collabor closer collaboration with major projects in MTIA. So there are some massive works happening as everybody here would be very familiar with, I'm sure, impacting your local communities. Um, huge um, task for the whole community, really. Um, and, you know, coming together has been a real big part of that journey. Um, so we did the major restructure on the 1st of July. That uh, only, what, six or nine months later, COVID hit. Um, COVID really slowed down the further restructuring that was required um, to, for DOT to reach its real, real um, ambition. Um, it, you know, there were huge impacts to our patronage, the way we operated changed, like everybody we flipped to working from home. Um, and <clears throat> the opportunity for cycling really came to the forefront uh, and those active modes really took a lead role, you know, rather than us talking about running trains and running trams, which we still were, we started to really talk about and focus on active transport, which has been a great opportunity for us to prioritise an important part of the community. Um, <clears throat> part of the work from my team was to understand what that looked like. Um, you know, what did that mode look like? So we, we, my team constantly talking about modes and how we identify modes and how we connect journeys. What does it look like when we have a mature cycling product? Um, so it's been a part of our work and a big part of that has been uh, the work in Wayfound and the big next part of the next steps is delivering an improvement through Wayfound so that we can work with councils, but also, you know, creating that standard so that we can work together. Uh, and I want to hand over to Dean, who might give us a bit of a background in Wayfound. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Look, um, I, I suppose, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, at the heart of Wayfound is um, is the aim to, to put the user at the centre of every journey. It's about um, honouring consistency, integrated approach to information, systems, identification, um, so that um, yeah, so that the, the experience is um, seamless for the user, whether they're you know, an everyday resident, whether they're a first time, a first visitor to the state or precinct or town, city, um, that there's a level of familiarity that can be very quickly established and, um, and uh, built on. Um, for for users, so so Wavefound is a is a um, it's a free resource uh, for people working for local councils, state government authorities, and private companies who are responsible for aspects of wayfinding and signage systems. Uh, the guide has been published by the Melbourne Visitor Signage Committee. And the background is in 2012, the CEOs of five Melbourne state government authorities agreed that poor signage was a problem for visitors, especially for Melbourne. Um, large scale development and cities, population growth, explosions. I mean, Melbourne was getting bigger, denser, busier, and more difficult to navigate. And as the number of visitors increased, so did complaints about poorly maintained signs, inconsistent information, and ineffectual sign placement. In some areas of the city, there were too many signs. And in places like Southern Bus Station, where arriving visitors most needed orientation and directional information, there were none. And look, and I've been working at, at the PTV DOT run for sort of nine years now. And I was sort of, I was working within public transport space, but no, noticing on the edge, there was a disconnect. There was an inconsistent approach to that. And I uh, was very passionate about trying to broaden, you know, the role of what we do and make information you know, as seamless as possible across, across all the sort of urban landscape. So the problem was clear, but the solution was not. 
and other relevant authorities were solely responsible for addressing the situation. And so again, um, you know, for integrated consistency, what needs to happen is that we've got to pull back and look at a micro macro perspective on things. Um, it's like my, my nice anecdote is we hop in a car, we drive around the road system and we look at the roads, roads road signs. Now, they, there is that sort of a, a state and national standard for that approach. There's a consistent approach to road signs and language and messaging. There's not a different set of road signs per locality. It doesn't change, it doesn't get identified differently. There's a function, there's a pure, wonderful, you know, um, macro view to just make it seamless and consistent and universally standard. Um, yeah, so, so even for visitors in, uh, coming into the country, there's, it does follow an approach as per other countries around the world. So it's, a, so it's, a, it's an intuitive starting point. Um, so yeah, way found at the heart of it is to try and play the same role, you know, looking at each, um, you know, existing, there are sign systems around like local, you know, um, councils and pathways and bike paths currently. And yes, you could argue that they do function, but there's, um, it's about going from where the crossing point from one precinct to the next, one street to the next. Um, and there's, um, the, the question is, why are they different? Um, so a way found the heart of this, that there's a, there's a consistent approach to all those graphic assets, um, symbols, wording, messaging, sizes, that just again, provides an assistant to that, to that rolling out wayfinding systems across uh, precincts. So, um, so the collaboration, so in the absence of a, a mechanism to address this problem, the CEO has established the Melbourne Visitor Signage Committee and um, went through a, a period of setting up this project. It was re relatively driven by uh, City of Melbourne. At the time effort, we worked closely with City of Melbourne to establish a, a design uh, prototype system that could be tested, um, iterative tested, and then fed back on. And then, um, and that's been you know, now rolled out across the city um, in a sort of a staged approach. Uh, it was not a clean slate, but yet, you know, opportunistic and staged approach and, and focusing on the real problem areas. And then we said we're we'll getting sort of negative feedback about. So yeah, way found, um, I'm hoping is, um, is going to be, you know, developed. And um, it's, um, it's definitely, it doesn't have a full aspect of all active transport, you know, approach laid into it. And hence, um, as we do, and my team do, we just work on existing opportunities. So working on the pop-up bike lane is another opportunity for us to say, well, there's a piece in the puzzle around cycling that we can look at and, and maybe problem solve and look at establishing to get a greater level of standards for cycling, work with each of the councils about what initiatives they're doing and then build on what's working and then maybe look at what's not working and improve that and again take a take a consistent approach about um, capturing the data that information and then um, again making a sort of a, a set of guidelines that captures cycling as well so it's building on that and then you know our, our, you know, our utopia is that we can align our sort of standards and documents guidelines uh, from from transport mode to mode, so if there's a there's a crossover point and a reference to each other to provide the sort of holistic answer. Um, so there's projects that are developed and, and delivered across uh, across uh, the city and the state. Terrific. Thanks, Dean. Um, so then, <clears throat> what we might do is is roll through and then we might take some questions at the end if it, if it's okay. So. Um, Hold your questions, and then I'll ask for people to put their hand up virtually when the time comes. But on 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 the running sheet, we've got um, Toby presenting next on bicycle pop-ups. Take it away, Toby. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, yep, great. Yep, Wonderful. Loud and clear. <laughs> Thanks, Dean and Dean and Pat. Um, great intro. Uh, I've I've got a couple of visuals just to uh, spark things up a little. Um, hopefully, we can uh, get this one going. Everyone with me on there? Yeah, I can see it anyway. Wonderful. 
probably not the important one to see it. But okay. Yeah, looks good. It's full screen now. That's perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, good evening, everyone. So my name is Toby Robbins, and I'm uh, part of the Pop Up Bike Lanes team at DOT. Um, and you know, I'm assuming most people in the room are familiar with the kinds of things that uh, we've been we've been trying to do here in the Pop Up Bike Lanes team. We we came out of the blocks pretty strong back um, uh, sort of late 2021 with Heidelberg Road, and we're able to get uh, some good kilometres on the board. Um, early and, and take a lot of learnings from that. So we're, we're still continuing to develop uh, the program and, and we've got a lot coming. Uh, as mentioned in that intro, we've got, got a lot on the on the run sheet at the moment. So uh, lots more coming, keep, keep posted on that. Um, but tonight we just want to take a, a reflection around, uh, a, personally for me, a really important element of what we've done here in the pop-ups program. And that is around using all of these learnings and this background that DOT has built and all this wonderful knowledge of people like Dean um, and try to apply that in a testing and trialing setting. You know, how often do you get a client come to you and say, hey, open slather, what do you need? What, what are the types of things you'd like to do on something on a project like this? How can we work together to make it happen? And, um, you know, to their credit, Dean, Dean took up the baton, Dean and co. And, um, built us this beautiful cycling identity uh, around, you know, what is the pop-ups? Who are we? How do we fit into this broader scheme, uh, into, into the state scheme? And um, I'll be talking a bit more about the signage tonight here. So I'll just jump into sort of some of the things we've done. So uh, focusing on the Northeast here back in 2021, late 2021, uh, sorry, early 2021, that's been a long time. Uh, we, we rolled out Heidelberg Road as our, our first pop-up lane. And just to give you an idea of how um, crazy and chaotic it was from the team's inception, our first team meeting together to building this on the road was less than 12 weeks. And I think we called um, Pat and Dean and co uh, probably at about week four and said, hey guys, um, here's what we're doing. Here's, we've worked out where we want to do it. Can you help us? Um, and it, it was literally a, a matter of a couple of weeks uh, for them to, to throw this together for us. So I think that's just, just demonstrates that that knowledge was there in the background, just waiting to happen. So uh, it was really great to pull it all together. I'll just touch on sort of the project. So Heidelberg Road um, has about three and a half lane kilometres of separated bike lanes on a major arterial uh, and, and a number of kilometres in local roads. And as you can see by the map there, uh, once you leave Heidelberg Road, some of those those local routes, there are a little, a few corners here and there. It's a little harder to find your way. It's not as easy. So we really needed a robust signage system to help our users navigate that path. That you know perhaps wasn't going to pop up on Google Maps straight away, or perhaps you know lead them in the right direction immediately. So for us, signage was really important, and how we sort of could tie that into our sort of project branding was really important to us as well. So you may be familiar with our work because we use yellow line marking, which is a little bit different. And so uh, one of the key elements around what we we're doing was tying that, that sort of yellow or that gold into our identity. So, um, you know, we may be familiar with some of the wave, wave found signage that we've seen around town. It's typically blue and white. So blue, blue being our sort of uh, cycling modal color. Uh, and then we're able to tie in a bit of the, the, the golden um, pop-up language into that and start to link that together so that not only did the, the signage provide a wayfinding element, that linked also to the on-road, um, the, sort of, the sort of actual physical infrastructure on-road. Um, Heidelberg Road has been a great success. We've had uh, around 300,000 trips in the first 12 months. Uh, we saw an increase in uh, female participation and a great diversification just generally across all users. And following Heidelberg Road, we moved into the second tranche, which was um, more of a local focus. And so that's you know, not just the, the bigger corridor, but how do you feed into that? How do you uh, sort of generate more local trips, help people uh, recreate? You know, we had sort of waves of lockdowns and people were doing things differently. So that, that initial approach of getting people back to the CBD just wasn't needed. Um, and so we, we had huge wreck cycling numbers in and around all of these wonderful trails in the inner Northeast. And so we looked at a number of sort of local connections and how, how could we improve those sort of those local journeys? 
Uh, and again, that throws a number of challenges around how do you find your way? How do you know you're on the right path? All those sorts of things. So uh, that allowed us to get deeper into our new signage content and start to test different ideas and, and different types of signs, those sorts of um, build that language that hopefully can kind of feed into maybe more of a permanent language for the state. Um, so this, is, this was our, our first crack, uh, called the Mark I signage. So this was the one that was done in a, literally a matter of weeks, um, fantastic work. So uh, we, we kind of started to get an idea around who we were and what we wanted to do and our look and feel. And we got it out there really quickly. Uh, and then, you know, we thought, great, that's cool. People were using it. We weren't having any complaints. Everything was great. And then over time, we sort of started to delve a little deeper. What's working? What's not? Yeah, it was it was done on core flute so that it wasn't, um, it was, you know, quick and, and easy. Um, that meant you couldn't really see it at night. Um, you know, it was it was going to be sharp edges on it. It sort of slipped around the poles a little bit. So um, we spent the next few months getting a, a little more refined in our approach and working out better ways to, to build the signs, better ways to present the information. And that's when we came up with our Mark II signage. And so this is, for, for me, I just, I just love this little signage kit. I think the, the, the DOT in-house team, the creative team has done a, a wonderful job on this. So we have now, again, it's still on a, a core flute base. So that's how we're um, slightly getting around some of the safety standards. It's not quite as dangerous as having a, a nice sharp piece of aluminium sticking uh, in, into your path of travel. So we're able to test a few different ideas with it, which is something that hasn't been able to be done before when using traditional signage. Um, but we still have a class one finish. We have a graffiti coating. So it's, it's good, it's robust, it's fun. Some of it's being kicked around a little bit out there at the moment, but um, overall the language that it's, it's sort of, we've been able to produce with this has been really interesting. And we've been able to test some fun ideas. So um, I'll just run through the, the third picture here is one of our mini maps. So that's when things get really complex and you don't quite know your way. Sort of test, testing ideas about getting that information and sort of graphically displaying it a little differently. And the one on the, the far right there uh, is at Edinburgh Gardens where we had concerns about speed through the shared path, which is you know, absolutely um, something we need to be considerate of. So we tried to help, help those sort of speedier cyclists uh, use an on-road route that was got them there in just about the same amount of time, if not quicker. Um, without a lot of that uh, sort of concern through the park. And then as well as advising everyone that if you take the path through the park, take it easy, take it slow, enjoy your time. And so just on the next page here, that's another example of that one, this sort of share with care messaging. So it's kind of the ability to test and play with ideas like this in a kind of a light touch, playful manner is, is sort of something that allowed us to sort of build different ideas and different identities. Um, just a couple of other examples there around what we do. Uh, we've got our project signage, which has been really great, putting those at uh, sort of information signage at key points like railway stations, schools, shopping centres, those sorts of things. So it's not just about your user on, on the bike lane or on the road. It's about how do you capture them? How do you let everyone else know this, what's going on? So there's just some of the kinds of things we've been doing here, um, hoping to sort of test some ideas, try some signs, and uh, hopefully we can feed that into uh, future projects and then hopefully um, into the more standard signage suite that DOT is looking to develop over time. Um, just end quickly on my favorite piece of all of this. Um, one day we said to Dean, hey, not everyone who rides a bike wears Lycra. They don't all look like the guy in the bike symbol. How can we fix it? And uh, we came up with this great little pack of diversity decals. So we have um, someone who's gone, done a bit of shopping. They've got the flowers in the basket. We've got the kids in the cargo bike. We've got the e-delivery, you know, we've got the, uh, the Uber Eats backpack on there because that's a, a really common user these days. Uh, an e-bike, a tandem bike, folding bike, you know, just, just a bit of fun, funky uh, signage there. So just trying to sort of lighten the mood a little bit and help everyone appreciate that not everyone uh, on their bike is uh, trying to hit a PB. They might just be out on their daily ride doing what they want to do and getting where they want to go safely. So that's, uh, that's my favourite bit anyway. Um, and as we say, thank you for writing. Uh, plenty more to come and uh, we'll hope to see you out on the network soon.
Wonderful. It is very cool that diversity decal set. Is is it, is that the one running along the bottom of of your slides as well? Yeah. Yeah, I've I've taken that one um, on board. We use it for absolutely everything. <laughs> nice. No, you you have to get sure. them. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Toby was a graphic designer in his previous life. He's always showing off our assets almost better than what we do at times, creatively so cool. using, repurposing them. Well, well, we'll come to questions in a minute, but I, I, I just want to implore you to make them into little cloth badges so you can sew them onto your backpacks as well. So, like, 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 a, like a scout badge or something. Next up is Rachel Goldsworthy, who will be talking about the Strategic Cycling Corridor signage trial. Oh, thanks so much. And look, I've got to say, I love those diversity decals. Um, I think that the idea with um, people who are interactive are really interesting. Um, I think the segments of an active customer, it's hard to say customer for active because what are you purchasing or user are, are really interesting. And, you know, I recall the first time I started at um, PTV as it was then, and I looked at the customer segments for PTV and I said, uh, cycling is my mode. Uh, where do I fit? And they said, oh, well, mm, I think you're PT preferred. And I said, absolutely not. No, no, PT is my second option if my bike's got a flat tyre or it's raining or something like that. And so it's been really great to see those um, as diversity decals um, displayed like that and their reaction is really exciting. Um, unfortunately, I'm no graphic designer like Toby, so my presentation isn't quite as cool, but um, bear with me. I also wanted to say that um, often DOT feels like a behemoth. Um, to people, but you know, um, personally, I've worked incredibly closely with Pat, Toby, and Dean, and I can also see Rachel Carlisle on the line as well, which is great. Um, as another colleague from DOT, weirdly enough, we're actually an amazingly close group who work together um, uh, very effectively. I came from the wayfinding team, so I worked closely true. with. Sorry, um, that is true. Uh, it is true. Yeah, we're actually a really very close knit. I know it doesn't often seem like it from the outside, but we are. It's amazing and. Um, you know, I came from the wayfinding team, so I started off with the bicycle pop-up stuff with Toby, worked really closely with Pat and Dean on that as well, and a whole bunch of other different um, pieces through wayfinding. So it's kind of in my blood, and now I've moved across to Active Transport Victoria. This is a really exciting time, I think, for, for DOT and how we're moving forward. Um, I wanted to also pick up on some of the stuff that Dean spoke about with the, the history of Wayfound um, Victoria. I popped a link into the chat as well, if you're not familiar with it. Um, we've also in the moment in the, the final stages of um, uh, pulling together a, a video, um, which we distributed most likely via MAV, uh, which talks about the history of Wayfound, how we got to this point, um, the incredible effort it's taken. I mean, I had no idea until I sat in some of these interviews with our, our key talent. Um, it has been uh, incredible and it is such a, uh, a precious resource. I love the um, project. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. So we look forward to everyone receiving that video as well. Um, and before I kick off as well, I've been I've sworn and declared to our comms team who are working on the strategic cycling corridor um, wayfinding trial to let you know it is a trial. I'm about to show you it's going to go into core flute exactly like Toby was speaking about. We do this because it creates an agile environment for us to work within. It means we're not saying, hey, here's a done deal. Go and uh, sort it out. Yeah. It actually allows us to trial, to go out there and to change things as well during the trial to get that feedback. So it's not fixed in cement, um, never to be moved again. This is a really important part of the sort of work that we do. So I thought I'd preface it with that as well. I'm gonna share my screen now and hopefully I won't muck it up. Here we go. And share. Hopefully you'll be seeing that screen now. Yep, can see. Yeah, wonderful. So. Um, the grand title, Strategic Cycling Corridor, Box Hill to Ringwood. So we're focusing on this area of the Strategic Cycling Corridor at the moment. I'm just going to make sure I can move back and forward. I'm really quite um, bad when it comes to um, moving my screen around. Oh, here we go. Oh, brilliant. Okie dokie. Mm -hmm. So our task. Um, we need to create a signage system that clearly identifies a cycling route at each end and at the junctions along the way, okay? And that indicates a change of direction and the route that continues the decision point. Decision points are the most crucial part of anyone navigating any part of our modal network. That's the real decision points make it really, really hard for people. And also directs to secondary destinations along the route. Like it could be um, public transport, it could be amenities, it could be just going into your high street to start to really breathe that environment of 
you can actually hop off your bike or walk through to there as well and really start to engage with your local precinct. Um, we also need to focus on the fact that it needs to be safely accessible um, by cyclists and in the case of shared user paths where they are, they do um, sort of intercept also for, um, for pedestrians. Um, and of course, toilets. I always amazed to think that there's that app just for toilets, the toilet app. Um, toilets are really important for us when we're out on um, in our navigating our areas. So um, we need to make sure that's right as well. And, and that whole idea of um, I ride every day, pretty much take the same route. Very, very familiar, even if there's a disruption on the route. Not everyone's familiar at that point. So making sure that that consistency comes through with, um, with signage that's along a route from there. Here's a little bit of an example of the sort of stuff. So um, we had some team members go out there and the very first thing they did before jumping in and starting to do the pretty pictures was they went, hey, let's come and see what the experience is like right at this moment. And they took some photos uh, riding, by the way, um, and, you know, you can see it's, you know, I use the word cacophony, which is the wrong word because it's to do with sound, but the cacophony or the visual cacophony that goes on here um, when it comes to signage, our brains are working really, really hard all the time when it comes to decisions. And the subliminal aspects of that visual language, which Dean spoke about and Toby spoke about, are really important for providing reassurance and a consistent approach to how we navigate our environments. Um, and also keeping in mind that a really good visual language is universal as well, so what it caters for our cold communities and the like. Um, and another page here. We do signs really well. I actually had um, a bit of a conversation going on with my partner a number of months ago along Mary Creek, and he said, so when there's like a cycling sign in green and a cycling sign in kind of blue, what does that mean? And I literally didn't know. I, I said, I think like perhaps it's because it goes just along a path, which isn't a road, green. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, that's the kind of stuff that goes through our heads. It's like, what does this mean? Yeah, when we start to look at these sort of inconsistencies. Um, by the way, this is this has evolved. It's organic. There hasn't been a rule book. It's okay, you know. So if you look and you see a sign you've put in here, please don't think I'm picking on you. It's just the way it goes, particularly this one. Who did this one? Anyone on the call who did this one, for goodness sakes, but that's okay. Um, so and 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 this sign as well. And it starts to then also look at uh, a visual language so far as hierarchy of messaging as well. So what we've got here is the main trail name kind of directional stuff and also some um, you know regulatory signage here about behavioral stuff as well so it's quite a lot for someone to take in in that one signage piece it's um it's quite amazing for our brains um should also have said um pat before mentioned that dean has worked on basically everything across the network um similar principles that were applied to the new um signage system for train tram bus now have applied to this as well insofar as that high graph um, uh, sort of level of information that goes on. We think about our key considerations. So the signage system needs to cater for pedestrians and cyclists, different speeds of travel. Um, I tend to not ride quite as quick as someone who's in Lycra um, at all. Um, user types and also that mindset. So I said before that familiar and unfamiliar, okay, that can change us very quickly with how we feel when we're in a situation. It needs consistency. Um, and so we get consistency through a, a kit of parts that can be used to sort of almost plug and play to a certain extent across all our different cycling um, paths across Victoria, ideally. So where we're at the moment is this idea of testing effectiveness. Um, and what we're seeing on the screen here is a bunch of different signs of a similar visual language um, with different information placed on them, as simple as that. Um, and so because of the fact that um, there aren't currently really clear standards or a green, des green design for directional signage and shared user paths, we need to start this process together. Um, and what we'll be doing for this particular part of the strategic cycling corridor is actually engaging with the community, um, accessible bicycle user groups, the bugs, um, and uh, through this trial to start to see how users um, feel engage and are assisted by this signage system. So we're testing different signage sizes. Yeah, think about as a cyclist, you're riding along, you don't have a lot of time to look across and look at the detail. You really just want to know and get that reassurance. Um, or there may be a point, a decision point at which you may pull across to get some further reassurance and further information. So we're testing these different sizes, um, different locations, um, and checking that effectiveness. 
Um, and we're also including these shared use pictograph, shared path pictograms as well, um, proposed signs to sort of think about what's a shared user path and then what's something which is dedicated to a cyclist. Um, because, you know, we do know that's a pain point when it comes to sharing space. Um, and Toby, I love that one through Edinburgh Gardens um, on the, the pathway, which talks about the, the shared space. Even just having that little dog there um, and that concept of, hey, think about where you are. Yep. Um, and, and modify uh, the way that you're riding to, to deal with this. So sign um, types. Oh, I was going to say, Rach, on, on that one, yeah. um, if, if you're really keen at the detail, there is a dog with a lead and a dog without a lead. Um, ah. so, <laughs> um, there is a, there is an off leash and an on leash version uh, that we that we can utilize if we need to. Oh, fantastic! Exactly, because I often think about my own crazy um, naughty dog down there and how that would be um, in that particular spot. So yeah, it is. It's it's a beautiful way of saying, again, subliminally reminding you about your behaviour in that particular area. Um, so what we've actually got here is these, uh, when we look at signage, we look at, into, we look at putting it to categories um, and series um, they have been named. Same applies to train, tram and bus, okay? So as a mode. Um, and so we've got our series here at number one, that's uh, so 100 of route identification. So that's that big piece that's right in front of you. You go, great, I'm on my right way. I know I'm on this trail. This is where I want to be. Um, and then we've got the extra element that gets added into directional signs for our 200 series. So a little more information. So it's saying how many kilometres and how many minutes. And then we've got, I guess everyone's quite familiar with the finger pointer signs, um, our directional um, signs here as well, which are quite a flexible piece in that series. Then we've got the stuff and this, um, again, you're going to start to see how the bicycle pop-up work is starting to inform the strategic cycling corridor work. It doesn't have to be completely different when it comes to this work, looking at how we can direct people around particularly complex situations with um, these maps, um, linear and the like, um, and placing them potentially, and I say potentially because obviously there's standards we need to align to when we're working through this with trialing and testing into more physical infrastructure. Um, to start to look at how that will work um, along those trails. Operational signs, just the things you've got to know. Slow down, there's a road ahead, there's a concealed entrance, just so people understand perhaps there's um, stuff ahead again they need to adapt their behaviour for. And so this is, um, the pack's actually enormous. Uh, Dean sent it through to me the other day and I'd love to keep you here until midnight. Um, but uh, our designers again went through and also someone from the wayfinding team went through and pinpointed every single location to place um, a sign for this trial. And they go through and they actually identify its um, dimensions and how many and what it's going to look like. And they, they pop it onto one of these maps here. So here's some examples of the sort of signage that's going to be going along here for trial. And oops. Move that one down. And uh, a case of one of the larger signs here, which may or may not become a totem, depending on how it goes in the future. And a directional sign with the how many um, meters, how many minutes along that way. And arrows. Arrows are a really interesting one. Um, the, the full detail, I don't think, has been provided here, but you can see how quirky this little error is here to navigate around as a mm. cyclist. And it may make you think, gosh, which direction am I actually heading? Um, anything but a hair, bin, a hair um, pin turn. And so, again, arrows feature a large way into how to help people navigate around and not confuse them more. That's actually the end of the preso. Um, so I'll stop sharing here. Um, yeah, so what's going to be happening next is um, we've gone through... Part of trialing and testing is about how um, our users feel about a system, which is great. It's also about understanding the complexities of rolling out a signage system across um, an area which has multiple um, asset owners, landowners and the like. It's hard. Yep. I was having a chat to one of our regional teams the other day who implement active transport projects and they said they're the hardest projects to do. They really are um, because there's so many different stakeholders to need to engage with. Um, it's tricky. And so that's been going through for a number of months now. The plan is to get the signage installed. Um, and we've also got um, some key comms teams who are working on um, engagement with cycling groups um, and council and the like to really start to get that information through um, so we can um, verify the direction we're heading and then go through that refinement process as well. Um, so yeah, there you go. Wonderful, Th thank you, Rachel. Um, I, 
I, I, th I think Pat's going to uh, tie it all together with the next steps uh, discussion, but then we might go to questions because I've, I've got a bunch and I know there's a bunch in the chat as well, but no, I'll keep you, it Pat. really brief. I'll keep it really brief. Um, yeah, looking at that, you know, there's a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of work happened, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, we've been lucky, I guess. We've had this opportunity and Toby touched on it, an opp opportunity to challenge and trial things. So we've been doing that. Our own regulations hold us back in some ways, potentially, you know, height restrictions, sign type restrictions, you know, we can do this, we can't do that. Um, with Toby's help and support and imagination, really, um, we've been able to go out there and just have a go. What do we think good looks like? You know, we've listened to people, we've talked to people, we've done sign types that don't currently fit in the standard <clears throat> sort of allowable sign types and you can see the adaptations that Rachel sort of presented there on how something could become legal you know or within regulations um, so at the moment we are doing some testing I think it's literally at the moment over the coming couple of weeks um, on the on that on those sign types from the pop-up uh, so essentially you know next steps you know we want to learn from our experiences we've had these great experiences so far um, we need to work with stakeholders and then we need to look at delivering. Uh, learning includes the insights from here, but you know there's going to be a number of touch points to gain insights and feedback from our community um, through Toby's um, project work, through the um, strategic corridor work, and through our own um, insights piece. <clears throat> so that's imminent, I guess, and um, and over the next few months. Uh, so we'll be looking and I guess ongoing it realistically um, because we are. Um, looking to constantly trial new opportunities as they as they pop up. Um, once we get that, once we start getting some of that feedback in, we need to sort of un we're looking to understand what that means and then work with our stakeholders to to really flesh out what those opportunities are. You know, are some of the things that we've been doing pipe dreams, or are they things that we can influence regulations or influence internally to become part of new standards that allow us more more opportunity or um, better what we see is better uh, customer outcomes or better user outcomes on the network um, to be able to provide, <clears throat> you know, signage at the right height. You know, signage at 2.3 metres in the air is not great if you're cycling and you're focused on what's on the road, you know. Um, but they're the regulations that we currently have to work with. So, you know, those challenges, managing those, man managing that opportunity is a big part of the next steps. Uh, you know, working through internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, you know, the feedback we get, we want to pressure test that, you know, work with the groups, no doubt, you know, this group as well. Um, and then really start to boil that down into what that standard looks like. So you've sort of seen we've got a pop-up standard and we've got the permanent cycling standard. Um, they work, you know, pretty much hand in glove, uh, but evolving that into something that's shareable, um, something that can then go into Wayfound, that's absolutely the, one of the driving ambitions of the work, um, because we're not doing this so that we can do the work. We, we understand that we don't actually deliver a lot of the work. Major projects deliver the work, councils deliver the work, other groups deliver the work. So, you know, having something that we can go out to people and say, this is what we think looks good. This is what we think we'd like, you know, people to be able to use and be a functional tool. You know, that'd be a great ambition. And, and the Wayfound document is part of that, but only obviously one part of that. Brilliant. If anybody else wants to add anything, Rachel or Dean or Toby, just to wrap up. <clears throat> no, I'll take that as a no. Um, you've uh, nailed it, um, Pat. I think uh, just to, to reiterate that the <laughs> challenges are, are amazing. You wouldn't think so. Um, there was a question there about um, from Alison about um, Wayfound and um, there's currently a placeholder um, cycling section there. We're very much aware of that too. Um, so we, we yeah. don't go and put anything into print that hasn't been validated. And um, part of this process is to validate against the um, bicycle pop-up and also strategic cycling corridor work before we put this in. The, the idea behind Wayfound is it's tried, tested, and it's ready to use. Um, and and endorsed. Certainly, and endorsed. And endorsed, yeah. Across yeah, the very group. true. Yeah, mm. so that's why it's important for us to um, just um, hold that, but it's, um, it's certainly on the road back. Wonderful. And uh, Sharrows and Sharrows, sorry to but Sharrows. Yes. You know, it's one of the one of the suite of communication tools. Well, we've got we've got. You know, what does a sharrow look Rachel's like? Rachel's certainly you know? on the line here, so she can talk about. What does a sharrow yeah. look like? <laughs> yeah. um, it can look like anything, from what I understand. But mm. um, you know, what would be some 
more informed guidelines that we can all work to that provide something really um, understandable. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Th thank you so much. It was an intriguing presentation. And there's a lot of interest, obviously, from what you've seen in the chat, but I'll invite people to put their hand up virtually now to go into a, um, <clears throat> into a question queue. Um, well, what I'll do is go straight to Tom and then I'll go to some of the questions in the chat because Tom's got to go at Lamingtons. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, everybody. That's fantastic. I'm very, very happy with the Holderberg Road pop-up bike lane. I just wish it would go a little bit further into Banyul. That would be fantastic. I hope that's on your radar. You've had a bit of pushback from certain industry groups, and I noticed the Small Business Council came out last week saying that they should remove some of the lanes in the city, which I thought was just ridiculous. But I um, haven't really got a question. I'm just very, just very pleased yeah. here that... Oh, actually, when you called Vic Roads a little dot, well, I've called them worse than that before um, <laughs> because I don't think they were that helpful for us, particularly in cycling infrastructure. But no, very happy with the pop-up lanes and congratulations on a great effort and they're super happy about it. And I think it's been a really... Maybe we should stop calling them pop-up lanes and making them permanent now because they have been so successful. But no, well done, everybody. It's fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Wonderful. Oh, and Rohan Leppert's got a, um, an op-ed in today's paper, I believe, as a response to the Vicky uh, piece, pointing out the, um, the the logical flaws in that argument, I think. So let, let's go to the chat now. And there's, uh, I guess, to your point, Tom, about the extension, um, Benish Chaudhry asked a question somewhere and she asked, are you planning to extend it further? If yes, what's the next milestone? This, this, this pertains to Heidelberg, I, I gather. Or, or, or the project broadly, is it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on Heidelberg and then I'll touch on the, the yeah. project more broadly. Um, yeah, look, I think Heidelberg Road definitely had some teething problems at the get-go. Um, you know, something uh, rolled out so rapidly. Uh, obviously, there's only certain stakeholder engagement activities that we could get done in that time. And I guess the, the whole concept of testing and trialling is to get it out there instead of trying to show a stakeholder a drawing that they have no idea what it says, um, we can just go and build it in a week and show them, you know, mm -hmm. they can have a look at it. <laughs> That's kind of the idea, right? Um, so, yeah, there, there are a few issues at the start, but we work through some things. Some things. Um, in terms of the testing and trialling mentality, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of scepticism from community that, um, you know, a trial is really just a, a, a tricky way to get something permanent. Um, we actually, we've actually made 10 changes on Heidelberg Road. They've been subtle, but they've actually been um, some serious changes. Um, we've, we've taken some hits, you know, there were some, some businesses that really needed some, some loading zones or some further support. So we, we, we have, um, you know, put, put some parking back in, in locations, but we've also looked to support businesses in other ways, uh, off street, et cetera. Um, but, you know, little, little tweaks and trials along the way to make things, make things different, make, make improvements for users here and there. That, that's the whole name of the game. Um, Huddleberg Road has been fairly successful. Um, it's, you know, I think it's, it's, it is starting to show its age a little bit. You know, it, it is trial uh, infrastructure. So it is, you know, probably in need of a bit of a, a, bit of a wipe down, a bit of a clean and a bit of a polish. Um, but overall, it's holding up pretty well and users are still still using it. And that's something um, I didn't get a chance to touch on in my presentation, but um, a really important part about Heidelberg Road that we've seen in the data is, you know, we all talk about winter being really difficult and you know, we lose cycling numbers in winter. Heidelberg Road has been consistent. We, we lost maybe 15, 20% in the coldest months, um, but across the board, month on month, we get great numbers. And that just shows that if you put safer cycling infrastructure out there, people will use it. And so, you know, we've got a really good baseline. We're building that data. It's been out there long enough. We're, we're starting to get an idea of what works and what doesn't. Um, in terms of extending it out to Benio, we, we would love to. Um, you know, obviously the project team would love to, but there's, there's obviously, um, you know, other drivers at play there and limitations in what we can do. But what we can do is get on with um, testing and trialing more opportunities. So uh, right now, uh, I think there's a message in the chat about seeing some lines in Yarraville. It's 7.05. So depending on how much rain we get in the next three hours, um, there should be crews in Yarraville this evening putting more yellow lines on roads. Um, there are uh, almost 20 kilometres of routes coming to Footscray. There are over 20 kilometres of routes coming to Mooney Ponds and Essendon 
there are over 35 kilometers of routes coming to Port Phillip. Uh, it is happening. There is a lot happening. They're not all glitzy and glamorous, um, but each each one sort of, you know, perhaps, perhaps you know, there, there might be some criticism, but there are a lot of shadows and there's a lot, not, not a lot of separation, but all of that builds to, to more cycling, safer cycling, better awareness. Uh, it allows us to test small things along the way. It could be an intersection improvement. It could be a crossing change. Um, it could be safety around a school. You know, there's a whole load of little things um, dotted amongst the packs here. So it's it's not just about your big, your big uh, Heidelberg Road ones. There's, there's a lot of local um, things happening as well, and that's what we're trying to do here. So uh, keep an eye out for it. It is coming in the next couple of months. Um, we should have taken up shares in the Yellow Paint Company, but um, we're not allowed <laughs> to do that. So <laughs> um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. I, I'll be riding into the Bike Futures Conference tomorrow, and I'll try out those new lines. Try and not get wet paint on my on my tires. Um, Melissa, you had a question, and 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 I, I'm guessing it, it's when's it coming to Werribee? Um, part of my question, Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentations. They were fantastic. And Toby, that was me that um, saw the yellow line marking going down in Yarraville today, so it was pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I was curious to know if you had any projects planned um, in the interface LGAs at all. Um, I'll take that one because I, um, while not officially, um, you know, permanent and uh, part of the furniture at DOT here, uh, I am kind of in the active transport realm. So uh, I'll just touch on, uh, we, we have just gone through a new, uh, a full restructure at DOT here again, as, as we do like to do. Um, and, but part of that is acknowledging the, the importance of active transport. So there is a new active transport development and delivery team, a dedicated active transport team um, in the transport services space, which is new, it's very exciting. Um, it may take us a, a little time to um, gather our thoughts and get everything happening, but I think there, there are good opportunities coming for active transport and, um, you know, hopefully with support and um, continued advocacy from all of our council partners, uh, I think in, in time we can definitely start to look at broadening the horizons of where we can come to town and what we can do. So, yeah. Keep asking the question, keep writing letters, keep talking to uh, everyone you need to talk to, and um, hopefully we can get to you sooner rather than later. I should just add to that um, too. Thanks, Toby. Um, Melissa, we've, um, we've got a, a separate um, piece of work that's going on working with Transport X um, at DOT, uh, an innovation piece which is looking at um, data standards for active transport, and we've been in contact with um, Wyndham. Um, to look at the sort of data set that um, they have available as well as City of Melbourne, um, City of Greater Geelong, um, and that's looking at being extended out as well because for all the, the fact, I love a yellow line on a road as well, um, but, you know, the, uh, another amazing way to support active transport is to be able to surface data, not only for planning for LGAs and DOT, but also to increase cycling and that confidence of cycling um, as a result of knowing where your safe paths are. So we're actually working um, really closely at the moment with um, those groups, and that's going to be another eight-week sprint coming up now, working more holistically across LGAs across Victoria. Exciting. Thank you, Rachel, and thanks for the question, Melissa. Um, there's a couple of questions of fact, which we'll cover off quickly. Ross Evans asks about the maintenance responsibility, DOT or council, typically? <laughs> Tricky one. Great, great question. Um, <clears throat> uh, horses for courses. Um, the, uh, in, in terms of the pop-up project, we take on responsibility for the asset for the life of the trial. Um, so that's a commitment we've been making with our LGA partners. Um, and that's been really important in getting some of these over the line. Uh, you know, imagine the state coming to you and saying, hey, here's, here's this great new um, shiny toy. Um, but once the paint wears off, uh, if, you could, if you could look after it, that'd be great. Um, so that's been a real challenge for us, is identifying what are the maintenance concerns, what are the issues, uh, who will look after this, who, you know, what is the path to permanency, what are the, what are the challenges there? So... Um, Speaking just, you know, in, ter in terms of this program, uh, we've been uh, really focused on continuing that as a DOT asset. Um, but more broadly, I think that's a really interesting question. I think over time, the opportunity for councils to play a much stronger role in active transport and perhaps, you know, the idea that, um, you know, DOT may have these, these sorts of signage standards or the, all these other standards that we, you know, we can help facilitate better outcomes yeah, across council boundaries. Um, but not necessarily be the asset owner or, or um, 
you know, the ones putting it in the ground ourselves. That's, that's something that I think needs a bit more work. Terrific. And Jane Waldock, the executive officer, asks, are times on signs for PEDs or cyclists? Probably cyclists. Yeah, right? yeah. For the strategic cycling corridors, they're for cyclists. Um, what we're seeing, what we're seeing, and it's interesting. One of the pieces with um, Wayfarm we were speaking about before is that um, we're finding because it doesn't have a cycling suite um, that um, some councils are actually using it, but then using the finger pointer signs and putting times for cyclists, times for pedestrians, and it's becoming again a little visually um, complicated. So we're addressing that as well, um, depending on the the primary use of of that particular pathway. But yeah. It was visualised for the strategic cycling corridor in this case, Jane. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I'm just scanning the speaker list. There's no one with a hand up. Uh, this is your last chance to ask a question because we've we've got a lot of agenda tonight. So, I've I've got a bunch of questions, but I don't want to supplant anyone else. Um, the, the, just a couple that occurred to me throughout the presentations was that um, how, how quickly are the uh, pop up lanes appearing on the new nav systems such as you know Google, Apple, Garmin ways tom tom that sort of thing how, how quickly do they translate into in car or on bike navigation systems um the answer to that is far more complex than anyone in the room could even imagine okay. all right let's, <laughs> let's move on it, it sounds like magic to me but um and god knows how it happens but yeah um yeah, a lot of arm twisting. Um, Fair enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the answer is not fast enough. It's not easy enough. And if anyone happens to have a direct line to Google, um, it would be great if we could get that to work better. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I'm I'm a um, map-making tragic and very fond of urban and graphic design. So I feel very proud of the, the idea that we're getting a standard suite of signs just walking around Williamstown I, and I didn't realize that it was a standard approach to have those sort of uh, slate gray signs with a little yellow pedestrian icons showing distance to a certain place within the suburb that, that sounds like that's already part of the, the new DOT suite and um, that gold on blue I think is really attractive really a classy look um, so do you I have an it's... opinion on cycling network maps and their value? Um, I, th I, th I think the ones when you can pull over and, and in, you know, check them out at a local level is useful, particularly when you, when you encounter a new precinct in the same way that, you know, when you get off the train and there's a map there to show you where to get or how to get to your destination if it's, if it's nearby is really useful. Um, I, I have been using the ones in Williamstown, the, the pedestrian ones. The, the cycling ones, yeah, I, I guess it's a matter of trial and error. Does anyone else have an opinion? It's not sort of currently on the um, on the agenda, but it's sort yeah. of it's sort of been discussed. But I'm um, not sure that there's a need. But I'm sure at some point we'll figure out <laughs> whether or not it is. Yeah, it depends. Depends on the density of information, I guess. You, you know, if, you, if, it, yeah. if you're coming into a place which is full of events, attractions, and options, I guess you know. Off you go. It's the only way to do it. Yeah, because I, I, yeah. You're trying to fit a lot of information into a small Would space. Transport X, Rachel, be the ones trying to solve how to get data into Google? Is that part of their remit? Do you know or is that? Maybe... Yeah, so where we are at the moment um, on that particular program of works, we're looking at a couple of pieces um, because with data, it, it, it comes down to two interesting needs. And um, one is from a planning perspective, and often that works better with internal systems. And we all know that internal systems can be notoriously difficult to wrangle. Um, and the other one, of course, is through open data or APIs. Um, and so where we are at the moment with that piece of work, and I say we, I'm, I'm an SME on the project, certainly not leading it, um, is starting to explore um, open street maps and the sort of work that we can do with that, uh, that group um, as, a, as a test bed mm -hmm. yeah, um, for, for exploring that. Um, it's, it's not, uh, I, wish it was, I wish it was as simple as just popping it out there. I guess the other part of this too is unlike, say, our agreements, our franchise agreements with um, the Metro and Yarra and the like, um, we, we know the stakeholder group is vast and all has different resourcing abilities and, and, mm. and time and the like. So data is only as good as it is current and accurate. Um, and so the governance process, the maintenance process needs to be worked at in parallel to as much as surfacing the information. Otherwise, we're going to have a bunch of really annoyed people people um, mm. who are being sent in the wrong direction. So um, this is all um, work we're doing at the moment. 
wish I had a magic wand and I could sort of, you know, fast forward us. Um, we're, we're finding out um, a lot during this process. Uh, what I can say is it's moving. Mm. And this is a really important part. And, and a part of that is actually engagement through local council to understand what's available um, within, which may meet with the data um, uh, framework and the standards, mm. um, and then what's reasonable as well. Um, uh, TMR and Queensland have some really great processes set up uh, within their own stakeholder groups for um, how often things are updated. It's realistic. Um, and so we're working with different jurisdictions and understanding the work they've done, um, learning from each other. Yeah, so, yeah, but it is, as Pat said, it's um, there's no magic answer to doing this quickly. Um, so, and there's a bunch of work also going into multimodal journal planning, uh, journey planning from DOT's perspective mm. um, to start to look at trips really connecting through to train stations, taking your, your bike through to a bus stop or the like, and then looking at the facilities available um, to you. So, yeah, it's quite a complex beast, but I guess that's kind of been, maybe that should have been the, the topic of our um, whole discussion tonight. It's quite yeah. a complex beast um, because nothing is as simple as it seems. Yeah, uh, but the, the, work, can, the work is happening. Sorry, Rachel, I was just going to say, I could take a moment to tell a funny little anecdote around how difficult uh, it is and why the, the work that Rachel and others are doing is so important around um, data and how we can do that better. Um, one of the first things we did as part of the Clifton Hill rollout was um, we banned a left turn. And of course, Google didn't know that. Um, and um, we didn't know how to tell Google. And we tried very hard to tell Google and we couldn't work it out. So um, what we actually did was we just got kind of a dozen of us or so to just, um, you can actually log, a, log an update on Google Maps. You can yeah, actually right. go in and report an error or report yep. something that's changed. Um, and so we just, a few of us just did that for a few days and it worked. Nice. So <laughs> you, can, you can always try a grassroots approach if you have to. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's low-hanging fruit, I think, for councils and generally in eco, eco dev teams is to, to go in and actually just put stuff in Google Maps directly. And, and, and then if it's authoritative and, and true and, and endorsed by other users, then it, it sticks, I think. Mm. I, I, th I think the, the open data approach is really good because, you know, the Victorian government's got their open data policy and, and a department and a website that releases those ones so if they're authoritative data sets and then they go mm. into open street maps then there's every chance they'll be picked up by tom tom and garmin and all the other all the other players as well so absolutely yeah yeah oh that's fantastic look, look i'm i'm I, I can ask questions all night and i'm already monopolizing the the, the conversation so i'll um i'll ask if anyone's got any any final questions to ask before we wrap up and it, it looks like um well, it's been a long discussion, very information rich and, and fascinating. Um, I love your energy. You've got a real esprit de corps. It's wonderful from our point of view to see, you know, the high morale in the DOT, particularly within the active transport space. And um, that the silver lining of COVID is that, you know, we've managed to roll out some, some really nifty on-road bike lanes and we're seeing them uh, completed over the next few months that it's, 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 it's great. You'll find strong support from the MTF. I hope that we can continue the conversation and the, the relationship between our various teams and have you back at a future date, maybe to talk about um, the, the data set and the standard DOT scheme once it's bedded down. It'll be great. Oh, absolutely be a pleasure. Terrific. Well, th thank you so much, Pat and Dean and Toby and Rachel. Um, th thank you for being here tonight and thanks for making the time and answering our questions thanks for having us Bye. thanks so Absolute much pleasure. Mm -hmm. thanks See very much Bye. See ya. Bye. terrific okay let's turn back to the agenda